Oh, wow, you do want to go to the toilet when you come here. Okay, so... Um, the moon. The largest and brightest object in the night sky. It has long inspired wonder and mystery. It radiates an air of magic and beauty. It has been associated with great love and often serves as a symbol of unreachable and unattainable beauty. And then, then on the 20th of July, 1969, we land on it. This guy in white uniform walks all over its surface and collects lunar rocks and brings them back to Earth as souvenirs. And ever since, we have been studying these rocks, analyzing them, having figured out everything about its composition, its diameter, its mass, its gravitational force. The magic is long gone. Or isn't it? The rainbow. This spectacular line of colors that appears in the skies when the rain ends and the sun comes out. This symbol of hope, this door from our world to other magical worlds. And then, then one day, Sir Isaac Newton comes along and says, well, actually, I've looked into this. You can do this by yourself. He described how you can produce the colors of the rainbow using just a glass prism and a slit of light. He described the whole of the rainbow's existence in a couple of graphs and a couple of equations. You can try this at home. Then the romantic English poet of the 19th century, John Keats, in his much-cited complaint, he accused Newton of unweaving the rainbow. He accused him of destroying the rainbow's entire mystery by reducing it down to a prism. And by that, I quote, including it to the dull catalogue of common things. It is now, as John Keats said, an awful rainbow. But is it? So, on a lot of occasions, scientists have been accused of being unromantic. It is said that with their urge to figure out how everything functions, they rob the world from its magic and its mystery. Now, I'm a biologist, I study life, and I'm a molecular biologist, which just means that I try to understand life down deep to the molecular level. So I study the building blocks of life, I study the cells. When I first saw human cells underneath a microscope, I thought they were beautiful. And that made me want to open my eyes wider and look closer, closer into the scale of things that us humans cannot normally see, so look inside the cell, but not just look to admire, but look to understand and admire, if possible, even if that means diving into a deep sea of complexity. Now, I study humans, and us humans are complex organisms, and I don't only mean women. <laughs> the way the human cell functions is overwhelming. It's a chaos. But as it proves, it's a chaos in order. To try and put it in a graph, I try to understand things that look like this. These are just some of the things that are going on inside the human cell. Believe me, this is a very, very simplified version. And this is something us biologists usually like to compare to this, the Tokyo subway map. <laughs> I think you see the similarities. So, I know understanding cellular mechanisms might look like a tough task, and it is one. But scientists have at hand a great tool to help them out, the so-called scientific method. Now, this scientific method for a scientist is, I think, what inspiration is for a poet. It's what lights the way. It's what keeps us going. Well, the scientific method and funding. To summarize, the scientific method can be summarized to this. First, you ask a question. How does this or that work? Then you do a bit of your background research to see if anyone else has answered it for you or partially answered it for you. Then you construct your hypothesis. You take an educated guess of how something might work. Then you kill yourself doing experiments, analyzing the results, drawing your conclusions, which could either lead to your initial hypothesis being true or being partially true, or being false. 
in which case you have to think and you have to try again. So scientists armed with this, either studying life or the world or the universe, armed with a scientific method, they're on a quest, they're on a journey. The journey of trying to figure out how we function, how the world functions. But is it true what they say? In this effort to understand the world around us, have we spoiled all mystery? Have we transformed beauty into equations, the miracle of life into dull chemical molecules? Have we minimized the beauty of the rainbow and have we stripped the moon from its mystery? Well, consider this. Isn't it exciting that we now know that when on the moon we are lighter, we lose so much weight? And this is due to its low gravity. So if you try to jump when on the moon, you almost fly. Isn't that magic? Or how about the fact that every time we look at the moon, any time of the month, any time of the year, the moon always shows us the same face. And we know that now because we know that it's in synchronous rotation with the Earth. Or how about the fact that the moon has had the ability to move the seas and the oceans around right here on Earth, and it has been doing that for the past 4.5 billion years, producing in this way the ocean tides, and it does that with its gravitational force. Or how about the fact that the moon is a silent place, and no matter how loud you yell, no one's ever going to hear you at the moon, since there's no atmosphere and therefore nothing for the sound waves to travel through. A place where sound is cancelled. Isn't that a magical place? And what about the rainbow? Is the rainbow less beautiful since we found out that the amazing colors we experience is the light itself being separated into its wavelengths by the raindrops? Think. Does it really have to be a treasure in the end of the rainbow? Isn't it a treasure by itself to know that everyday light is truly so many colors, but hidden and waiting to be revealed only under the right circumstances? And can't this explanation by itself be inspiration for even greater poetry? And to the greatest poem of all, living organisms, us, humans. Biologists are hidden in the labs, trying to unfold our very nature, asking questions about how we behave, how we function, why we love, why we care. They have read our genome, they try to read our epigenome. But do we spoil our beautiful existence when we try to understand which chemical molecules are released in my brain when I listen to music I love? And isn't it stirring to know that it's this thing called dopamine, a feel-good molecule and slightly addictive, and the same thing that's released when you're having sex or when you gamble or when you eat delicious food? Do we minimize a passionate kiss when we know that it causes the release of endorphins in our brains, molecules that have the same effects as cocaine? and as opiates, and the same thing released as we heard when we go for a long jog. So we might as well let drugs aside and go for a long, long run or kiss passionately. It has the same molecular effects. Do we minimize love when we try to understand which chemical molecules cause my heart to beat faster when the man that I love walks into the room? And isn't it amazing to know that this thing called love literally dominates your body, making your cells produce adrenaline, a hormone that takes over, increasing your heart rate and diverting the blood from your stomach and from everywhere in your body to your muscles to prepare you for a fight or flight situation and leaving you with only butterflies in your stomach. Does science destroy or does it reveal? Is it conflicting or is it complementary to true beauty? Now, I want to share with you my favorite example in our own body, a mechanism in our own body that I can only describe as beautiful. You see, our body functions in amazing ways, and the way it fights off intruders is one of the most glorious ones. 
For a long time, scientists were trying to understand, and they figured out that humans are naturally designed to fight off anything foreign that enters their body. Bacteria, viruses, even organ transplants. And this is due to a complex but very elegant protection mechanism we all have, and that we call the immune system. Now, the amazing thing with your immune system is that it knows you better than anyone else in the world. It knows every single cell in your body, so it can realize when something foreign comes in and attack. Imagine your immune system as the police force, where specific cells act as the military intelligence, traveling everywhere in your body, seeking out for possible intruders. And if they find them, then they send a report to another department where soldiers called the killer cells destroy those invaders. So, Scientists were trying to understand this mechanism, and then science did what it usually does. It gave birth to more questions. Sir Peter Medawar, a British biologist and the receiver of the 1960 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, he was working on transplant rejection at the time, and he was puzzled. What about pregnancy then? You see, we all have something in common. Once, we were all embryos, living peacefully inside our mother's belly in an excellent bed-and-breakfast environment without any distractions until our birth. But for Medawar, this peaceful life inside our mother's belly should theoretically be impossible. And this is because mothers, like all humans, have this immune system at place. And think, as an embryo in your mother's belly, you were only 50% like her. Your other 50% belong to a total stranger to her immune system, just a random guy as far as your mother's killer cells are concerned, your dad. So being 50% like your dad inside your mother's belly means your chances of surviving pregnancy should have been zero. Yet, we're all here. And that's how the pregnancy paradox was born. Believe it or not, Scientists have been struggling with this paradox for the past 50 years. Some argued that maybe the embryo finds a way to hide from the mom's immune system. Others said that the placenta provides a physical barrier between mother and baby. We might not have a full answer yet, but a few years ago, scientists found something amazing. The mother's immune system does see the baby. The military intelligence identifies the growing embryo and informs the killer cells of the intruder. But the mother's killer cells, instead of destroying the embryo, they themselves commit suicide and die. So in the particular area in the belly where baby and mother meet and shake hands, the mother destroys her own immune system for the sake of her growing baby. And this, I think, is one of nature's examples of love and sacrifice. An example of risking and caring for life, but down deep, very deep, to the molecular level. So, I do believe that human beings, too, become more magnificent the more science finds out about them. Yes, we are cells and hormones and neurotransmitters and all those things. Even bacteria in our large intestines, we're that too. But as we slowly understand ourselves and slowly put the pieces of our existence together, the beauty and wisdom of millions and millions of years of evolution unfolds. For me, that's the real magic and the real miracle, that there is a beautiful molecular world hidden inside the world we live, that can reflect on our character, our behavior, our love, and our kiss. We are cells, complex chemical reactions, and still this mess, this chaos, this crowded body of ours filled with all sorts of molecular happenings that looks just like the Tokyo subway map, somehow works beautifully and walks, talks, breathes, and most importantly, tries to figure itself out. We are life's way of trying to understand itself and the universe. So let's do it. Science can give so many beautiful answers to the mysteries of the world and our existence. 
Answers sometimes even more magical than the questions themselves. So let's live to learn about them. Let's live to learn about the magic around and the magic within. Thank you.